Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so welcome to the Cluster API tutorial. Uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, I'm Killian. I'm Yuraj. Hi. I'm Stefan. I'm Jack. And Shivani uh, is supposed to be presenting with us today, but she couldn't be here due to travel restrictions. We're going to have a video from her in a few minutes. Uh, so a couple of announcements. Um, there's prerequisites on the tutorial at the link. If you've all run through them, can I just get a sense in the room? Can you put up your hand if you have done the prerequisites? OK, good showing. Um, so we're going to take a few minutes now to just let people run through the prerequisites. A couple of important things. Uh, if you're running on Fedora uh, on your laptop or whatever, if you go to our troubleshooting guide, there's a specific setting you've got to set in Fedora. The tutorial can be unstable uh, on Fedora because of yeah, system limits. So please just check that out. Also for Windows, if you're using Docker for Windows to run this tutorial, uh, you want to be using Docker for Windows 4.10.1. <laughs> uh, newer versions are very unstable for reasons we didn't figure out. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so let's go through some of the uh, basics of the prerequisites just to um, talk through that. Also, if you have a Docker Hub account, Docker login will help prevent you from getting rate limited. Uh, yeah, so just to repeat what Jack said there, um, if you, yeah, we will get, if you're pulling the images, which is part of the prerequisites, uh, please do log into Docker because otherwise uh, this many people pulling from the same IP is probably going to limit it. So yeah, so the prerequisites are up there on screen. They're also on the repo. Um, this is the link to the repo. Let's see uh, if I need to type it in. Uh, it's also on the shared entry, the description. Um, so it's there, the CPU limits, uh, RAM, 32 gigs of disk space. You need to install Docker, kubectl, kind, uh, clustercuttle, and Helm. Uh, all of the instructions for installing those things are in the guide. And there will be people circulating around the room for the next few minutes. Uh, just see if you've got any trouble with that. Yeah? Yeah. Sounds good. Just... What's going on? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you have trouble, just put up your hands and somebody will come to you. Um, uh, do you want to say something about five to ten minutes? Hmm? Do you want to say something about five to ten minutes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll do this for uh, the next five to ten minutes. And we'll time box it, and then we'll get into the full tutorial. Oh, you should yeah. um, check, check, take a mask with you. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Just yeah. on the head, do the same. Just if you get new to people. <laughs> Scroll to the top so that the GitHub link is more visible. GitHub name is more Just visible. So just for anybody just joining us, we're going through the prerequisites currently for the next about five minutes. Um, if you haven't already managed to run through them. I could not do and see this guy. 
So can everybody see the font or is it too small? Okay. Uh, now, at the point you need to exit your shell. started two minutes. Okay, so uh, there'll be people circulating through the room throughout this tutorial. Put your hand up if you want help with any of the steps. If you still haven't passed the prereqs, uh, please, yeah, uh, ask for help later on if you need it. Uh, so now we're going to hear from Shivani. Shivani is going to give us a quick overview of Cluster API as a project, uh, what the project is doing. And yeah, let's hear from Shivani. This one? Yes. Thank you. No worries. Um. And then turn this up. I'll turn you up at the board. Is that, is that loud enough? A little louder. Yes. 
without any tooling is very difficult there are uh, several tools that solves a part of the problem and this is that is intentional like as the sig which is focusing on building this tutorial wants to solve the pro pieces of the problem and never tries to build one solution and even not try to build one solution that fit all problems that's because they don't believe that will actually have traction in the community as everybody's needs are so different cluster management is really difficult and one of the pieces that difficult is cluster creation so we have cubarium for that piece but another uh, another part of problem uh, is managing infrastructure so even uh, if you have bootstrapping tools like cubarium they assume that you already have physical or virtual machines to run cubarium commands on top of it but to get this environment we should have a uh, infrastructure specific knowledge also we don't have any common uh, interface until cluster api that ties together the infrastructure around tools like cubadium to uh, provide you a sort of holistic way to set up and manage the kubernetes clusters so like till here we have discussed a bunch of uh, problems but now we'll see how we can solve it using the cluster api first and foremost like cluster api is a declarative api and prior to this the kubernetes ecosystem didn't really have a way to represent clusters and machine inside of a kubernetes cluster itself it not only helps in creating and managing kubernetes objects but also provides declarative apis to orchestrate the underlying infrastructure components we really think that it's important to have the pluggable architecture while we don't want to provide common logic to solve these use cases for people it's not going to be one size to fit all problems so one place where it's really important to have a pluggable architecture is the level where we interact with infrastructure provider for infra provisioning or management we should have a provider abstraction where we can plug in support for any new cloud provider or bare me uh, bare metal provider providers relatively easily finally we really want to be able to enable common tooling to manage cluster across many different environments so now we understand how cluster api helps and what is cluster api but let's now look at the official definition of cluster api we also call it as capi and it's a project of sig cluster life cycle it uses kubernetes to manage kubernetes which is also referred by capi logo turtle all the way down and by official definition cluster api is a kubernetes project to bring declarative kubernetes style apis to not only manage kubernetes objects like pod deployment but also useful in creation in cluster creation configuration and management so here we are done with cluster api basic introduction Let, now let's look take a look at a uh, next item from our agenda so to establish a common language that you and i can use throughout the remainder of this tutorial i would like to provide you some definitions for frequently used term so the first is management cluster management cluster is a kubernetes cluster on which into which the cluster api components have been installed this enables the management cluster to manage the life cycle of other kubernetes clusters that are known as workload clusters and this is the place where we uh, like deploy our workloads our and our application we also have another term like self hosted management cluster there are type of management clusters that manages uh, itself so to accomplish this uh, life cycle management cluster api also leverages the concept of a provider providers have names like cluster api provider for aws for cluster api provider for azure and similarly vsphere and mo many more these providers are also known by their acronyms like kappa capz capv and so on 
so they provide the support for an integration with a particular infrastructure platform and in the last of this uh, glossary section we discuss what all things comes under inside cluster life cycle management so it includes creation and deletion of your kubernetes cluster including the underlying infrastructure managing the underlying infrastructure scaling up scaling up and down the number of nodes in the cluster and upgrading clusters to another kubernetes version so now let's see how does cluster api work but before uh, directly jumping into the cluster api functionality i want to give a brief overview of kubernetes some of the kubernetes concepts that are heavily used uh, in cluster api so at the core of kubernetes is a control loop we also call it reconciliation loop that is responsible for reconcile reconciling the desired state and the actual state reconciling desired state and actual state simply uh, means changing actual state uh, to look like the desired one the desired state is the intended uh, is the intended state of the system which is specified by the user and actual state refers to the state in which your system is actually in the controllers are the components that implement those uh, control loop which modifies the actual state based on the desired one the kubernetes way to specify the desired state is through objects called custom resource definitions the crds have a spec object representing the desired state and status object representing the actual state along with crds we implement their controllers and cluster api uses the crds and controller to extend kubernetes to manage the life cycle of clusters basically users want to specify the configuration of clusters and based on this configuration let the controllers implemented by cluster api to create and manage the cluster this way the building blocks provided by kubernetes in the form of crds and controllers are used to create or manage your new kubernetes clusters let's see uh, this again uh, for more understanding with this diagram here uh, we have a management cluster uh, on which are we are running our cluster api components and we have one client so the user specifies the declarative cluster configuration in the form of crd to the management cluster the cluster api controller then present in the management cluster read those configurations uh, available in crd and create new kubernetes cluster based on that configuration this way capi makes the actual state of the system same as the desired state now let's see what all uh, cluster api components are running inside management cluster so the controllers are divided into four types of provider based on their responsibility and each provider has a manager which runs their respective controller so in a uh, cluster api components we have four type of managers core controller manager bootstrap controller manager infrastructure controller manager and the last one control plane controller manager now we'll see uh, in brief like what all these uh, these manager contain with the help of uh, this diagram so core provider manager infrastructure provider manager control plane provider manager and bootstrap provider manager they are uh, they contain some type of crds and their definition so the core one have four type of uh, crds cluster machine deployment machine set and machine crds similarly infrastructure provider contain infra, infra specific controllers that are responsible for connecting with the infrastructure be it cloud or uh, bare metal servers whereas in the middle you can see control plane provider and it's responsible for initializing your control plane and bootstrap provider finally responsible for bootstrapping other worker nodes into our kubernetes cluster i think it's a big uh, bit high level view but now let's understand how these mentioned crds work with each other so in the next few slides i'll explain each of the uh, crds mentioned uh, in the previous slides and their interaction first we'll take a look at cluster crd it's a root of whole thing 
and responsible for maintaining the cluster life cycle environment specific configurations like pod service ciders and dns domain goes into the cluster uh, sorry uh, dns dns domain goes into the cluster specification next we have infrastructure cluster infra can be aws azure vsphere or even bring your own host and specifications uh, under infra cluster are based on underlying infrastructure and have details required for that particular environment next we have configurations for initializing your control plane by default capi supports cube adm and its related uh, specifications like init and join configuration are mentioned in control plane crd so once control plane is initialized we need machine deployments that defines machine for the worker nodes so that's how the these all these crds interact with each other and dependent like their flow is streamlined and they are dependent how they are dependent on each other next we discuss about a uh, cluster class and managed topology it's a huge huge ux improvement on how end users in interact with cluster api and it basically reduces customer surface area of in interaction the sole idea behind cluster class is we just want to define the structure of a cluster or the topology of a cluster once and reuse it across multiple clusters so that we just have one object called the cluster object in which we will have a topology section which then can be used to stamp out clusters that look alike so that would look something like this or uh, like this on the screen so if you see on the left hand side we defined a cluster class it's a collection of templates and when we provide different managed topologies to the cluster class like we have here cluster a managed topology and cluster b managed topology then they refer it then the cluster then they refer this cluster class to create two different cluster object which looks alike but also different in their own way so that's how we can uh, leverage uh, the concept of cluster class to create different clusters which looks alike so that's all basically with the cluster api fundamentals and now with other fellows will uh, fellow speakers will start with hands on uh, hands on part thank you everyone okay i just like to really thank uh, shivani for that video um, and yeah, it's just really nice to have her here in some way. Um, so I guess at this point, have we got hands for who's done the prereqs? Have a lot of people managed to do them during the course? Anybody having <coughs> serious problems that they'd like help with at this point? Again, hand up anytime, somebody will come to you. Um, so yeah, for those of you that have your Docker kind, everything set up, uh, it's time to get your first cluster running. So let's see what that looks like. So. Uh, at the bottom of the prereqs, if you've got that open on the tutorial, there's the link to the next section, uh, which is creating your first cluster or cluster API. So let me make sure I've got my command line here. Okay, so uh, the prerequisites mentioned this a bit, but this is going to be a cluster you're going to set up using Docker infrastructure. So you're going to set up Kubernetes clusters where each node is running in a Docker container on your local machine. Uh, so we have a cluster API provider called CapD, cluster API provider Docker infrastructure uh, that manages this for us. You can also uh, use cluster API to set a, uh, clusters up across any number of clouds, bare metal environments. There's loads of different providers. Uh, and we have a quick start guide for a lot of those. The actual flow of the quick start might be a bit different, uh, which I'll explain in a few minutes. But yeah, so you can set up clusters on AWS, Azure, GCP, DigitalOcean, uh, and we've got a list of providers on the Cluster API book online. Uh, so for this guide, this part of the tutorial, like the prerequisites, is split up into Linux, Mac, and Windows. So select the version that's closest for you. Uh, the Windows version is PowerShell with Docker for desktop. If you're running in something more like a Linux environment on Windows, so VM or uh, WSL or something, you might want to follow the Linux guide instead. But yeah, so click on the one of those that's closest to your system, got Mac OS. So the first thing we're going to do is set up a uh, single Kubernetes cluster. 
Uh, so we should have already pre-pulled the images. So these are all the Docker images we used during the tutorial, uh, during the prerequisites. So uh, I'm going to make sure I'm in the right directory. And I'm just going to run the script to create a kind cluster. This is a normal enough kind cluster. It just has a couple of slight uh, changes to help it work with our uh, infrastructure provider for Docker. So this cluster is going to form the basis of our management cluster. So once it's up and running, the next step will be to install the management components on it. And those components are what will manage new clusters that we create using Cluster API, manage their lifecycle, manage their infrastructure. Um, all of the providers that Shivani showed us there, so the core controller manager, the infrastructure controller manager, the control plane controller manager, and the bootstrap controller manager, they run on the management cluster, which then creates other clusters, which we call workload clusters. Okay, uh, so once we've got our kind cluster up, we just... Just check our nodes. Um, so we got one node, there's a single node kind cluster. So now we're gonna install the management components. Uh, this is the controllers I mentioned earlier, so uh, Cluster API is pluggable, so we've got the idea of a control plane provider, and there's multiple implementations of that. So the specific providers we're using today are the Docker provider for infrastructure, uh, CAPZ, which is the Azure infrastructure provider is an alternative to that. We're using the core Cluster API provider, which every setup uses. That's what manages the fundamental CRDs that uh, Cluster API manages. Uh, our bootstrap provider is using kubeadm, so we've got a core, in our core repo, we've got a API, or a cluster API provider, a bootstrap provider for kubeadm, and similarly, we've got a kubeadm control plane provider. But everything except for the core manager is pluggable. So to run this, we just need to uh, run this command, GitHub has this copy and paste, which I should use more. <laughs> so we're just gonna copy this, so this will uh, set up a couple of environmental variables. So one of them is the repository we use locally. I'm just gonna let that run while I explain. Uh, the next two are feature flags that we'll be using in the course of this tutorial. So these are recent features that were added to Cluster API over the last, uh, I guess, year, 18 months. The first one is cluster topology, which is cluster class. This lets us create many clusters from a single template that we stamp them from. That template's called a cluster class. Uh, this is the difference you may see with, on the quick start as it stands at the moment on the Cluster API book. Uh, many of the other providers aren't using cluster class as their primary method right now, but the cluster provider for Docker should be very similar to this guide. Uh, runtime SDK is another feature that we're using. We'll see that a little bit later. Um, and so this will install all of our controllers and it installs uh, cert manager as well, which we just need to manage communication between components. Uh, so now that we've installed those, so cluster cutler init does all of that for us. We can just see what pods are running on the cluster. And we can see CAPD, this is our infrastructure. This is Docker controller manager, kubeadm bootstrap controller, which handles the bootstrapping of the nodes, kubeadm control plane controller, which handles our control plane, and the CAPI controller manager, which is our core manager, and then some cert manager, and the normal uh, Kubernetes control plane components are there as well. So now we've got a functioning management cluster. The next step is actually to create a cluster. So the first thing we're gonna do is create the cluster class, which I mentioned earlier. That's this command, so all of these are in the repo. So we just apply that like any other uh, Kubernetes resource, and that will create the cluster in our API. So we have that successful. We can take a look at the what the cluster looks like just before we create it. So uh, this cluster, because the specific spec of the cluster is defined in our cluster class, it hides a lot of that complexity. So this cluster is a very simple uh, object. It has a name, namespace, a little bit of networking information. And then under the topology, which is how we stamp the shape of it, this is the cluster class that we've just created. It's just called Quick Start. We've got a Kubernetes version. We've got the number of replicas we want in the control plane. And then under workers, we've got, we want a single machine deployment. This is analogous to a deployment in Kubernetes. And we want one machine in that machine deployment. 
So, just going to create a cluster. And we're going to use cluster cuttle. So cluster cuttle is the CLI that comes packaged with, uh, with cluster API. So it's part of the core repo. Um, so you should have been able to download this during the prereqs. I'm going to use watch here. Uh, if you have it installed, it's encouraged to use watch for a minute. So with cluster cuddle describe, we can see all of the different parts of the cluster come up. So cluster API, after creating that YAML, simple YAML with 10 or 20 lines, uh, we create the cluster. It goes away and links it all together. It creates machines in the infrastructure, in this case, Docker containers. It will bootstrap those machines into nodes. It will uh, boots up the first machines into a control plane node and then create a second node that will be a machine deployment, which is a worker node. And this is all then managed centrally from our management cluster. So next up, let's just have a look at the clusters. Again, it's a Kubernetes resource. We can just have a look at it uh, any way we want. So. We can see the cluster there, it's in provision state. And the next thing we can do in order to install stuff on that cluster, we're gonna use kind because this is using Docker infrastructure, we can treat it as a kind cluster as well. We're gonna use kind to get the kube config. And with that kube config, we're going to get the nodes in the cluster to see how they're doing. So right now we only have a control plane node. Uh, it's not ready yet. So these nodes will become ready in a minute once we install the CNI. And we can do kubectl get machines to see how the machines are doing. So we've got two machines, but only one node, and that's because the second machine, which is our machine deployment worker, uh, that's still waiting to bootstrap. So I'll come up in a second. So to make our nodes into ready state, we're going to install a CNI, in this case, Calico. Just get the CNI ready condition. Uh, so we're using the kube config for our cluster. We can get the pods. We can see the Calico nodes coming up. And we can just have a look at the nodes and just wait for them to be ready. So we can see we've got, so the first command here is uh, get nodes on the workload cluster. We can see both of them have become ready. One's 19 seconds old, that's the worker. In cluster call describe, everything is true. So this means that all of our machines have come up, all of our nodes have come up. Yep. And just to have a look at our clusters again. Okay. So that's your first cluster. Um, you'll have a few minutes or a few, kind of a couple of minutes to finish that up, but have people been successful in managing to create their cluster? We got hands up for people who've actually got one up and running. People happy? Yeah? Cool. So next section is we're going to use the Cap Visualizer. This is an open source project that's kind of sorry. Um, so it's by Jonathan Tong. So uh, Jonathan made this really cool open source project that we're going to deploy in our cluster now on our management cluster. And it'll just let us have a look at what the uh, cluster looks like. So I'm going to open a new terminal to run this. Uh, so we're going to use Helm to install this. Uh, you should have all the charts and everything locally. Um, so run that Helm command. We can see it's come up here. And the next step is, so we're going to just run a port forward. You might want to do this in a different terminal window and leave this running in the background uh, because this visualizer is a really interesting thing to look at throughout the tutorial. So it's really good to get an overview of what your cluster looks like. So we're going to run port forward and like that command, you can either run it in the background in your terminal or run it in another terminal and just make sure it stays up. It'll take a couple of minutes to get up and when you contact it, it does tend to die if it's not up yet. So let's just try that in a couple of seconds. Okay. 
Yep. So we can see this is our management cluster. Sure. Um, so this is our management cluster. We're going to click into Docker Plus One, and this is the overall topology of our cluster. Once you've got your cluster um, uh, up and running in your machine, run this. Like I said, if you keep it running in the background in your machine, you'll be able to check this throughout the tutorial as we go through uh, different operations, scaling, and see what happens. Um, so I think for the next few minutes, um, we're just going to run around and just help everybody who can get up their first cluster just before moving on to the next section. I hope I'm but just give five minutes or something. With it, five minutes yeah. or something, just to um, let people get up. Maybe you raise the table right there. <laughs> You have a yes error like enable the read image data from uh, from cup D. Ah, error failure to preload the images into the Docker machine. Do you wish could you? Uh, it seems that he is missing some images that, that we are expecting. Which, uh, which did you did you do the pre poll script? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it worked. Seemed to work fine. Yeah, it seemed to. Uh, let's check it. Had, let's check if you have all them, uh, because I don't remember which one. Uh, I mean, all these guys came from the pre poll. I can read. This is from the which pod? Is this uh, log stream? Uh, yes. okay. This is the CapD controller. Yeah. Okay, got it. Cool. A CapD control. Oh, we can, we can look at the. Uh, the cap uh, the cap image to see which should I try to pre pull the image? Yeah. What is the drop again? Uh, let's see. Uh, maybe the I don't know if the images are only maybe they're only def I don't see the exact. 
Okay, how many folks built their first cluster API cluster in the last 20 minutes? Wow, that's great. I see like 10 hands. How many people totally failed to do the same thing? Nope. Oh, one. A couple of people are. Okay. Yeah, ra if you, raise your hand and, and we'll, we'll have folks come and help you out. No, it's not. It's, that's separate. Yeah. Well. Let's drop it for a second. Yeah. So, Suit Manager is doing the thing to capture the API required to get that. For my colleagues out there helping out, thumbs up, thumbs down on mo progressing forward. Should we wait a few more minutes? What do we think? I think that means wait a few more minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> 
Hopefully my voice is loud enough. Some folks heard that anyway. All right, so the next section we are going to go through is cluster topology. So when we say cluster topology in cluster API, we mean, uh, you'll hear terms like shape and size. So typically it means things like the number of control plane nodes running on your cluster the number of worker machines running on your cluster, the number, number of pools working uh, of worker machines running on your cluster. And um, what we can demonstrate, now that you've built a cluster with Cluster API, the real power of doing things like cluster fleet management can come into focus with these cluster topology gestures. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to add a new pool of worker nodes. So. If you have your clusters all ready and set up, what we're essentially going to do is define a new declarative spec that uh, declares a new worker pool node. We're gonna point our kubectl to the worker cluster that we're running, and we're gonna apply that spec, and we'll see uh, an entirely new pool of nodes show up in our cluster. So here in, as for reference, if you, if you folks can see this, this is what the original sure declarative spec for our oh, yeah, sure. worker nodes look like. Um, you see we've got this workers and then machine deployments array, and we've got one entry in that array called uh, of a class default worker. So what we're going to do is I'm gonna copy this command and show you the difference between what we originally installed and this additive uh, YAML spec. So we can see that there's a new entry called MD-1 with a replica count of one. So if I apply that real quickly, let's see if I can 
define a command to get the current nodes. So here is, here's the current set of nodes running on the system. So you can see I've got one control plane node. It's that second one in the list. And then I've got one worker node with, if you look right in the middle, you can see, even though the text is really small, you can see that little prefix MD-0. So again, we're going to apply a spec that installs a new pool and it's gonna be identified with MD-1. So I'm gonna run this kubectl apply command. And now I can do this, get nodes, and I can watch it. And before too long, we should see another node appear. Let's see if there's any other material here. So wait a few seconds for you folks to do that same kubectl apply and then while that's happening, hopefully this get nodes watcher statement will give us what we're looking for. There we go. So you can see it's identified there in the middle of that long gnarly string with an MD-1 and now we've gone to ready. So that was an example of, let's like sort of revisit what we just did. That was an example of a really simple kubectl gesture against the management cluster to add a new worker pool. And so then on our worker node, we've got a new node coming online. And another fun thing we can do is if we go over here to our visualizer, you can actually see, you saw there for a second, the visualizer um, sort of refreshed itself. So now we can see, even though it's a little tight in there, uh, we can see we've got another machine deployment that's a cluster API CRD. So we're, again, we're looking at, in this visualizer, we're looking at the cluster API abstraction layer. So these are the, this is the view of the cluster from cluster API's point of view. But you can see if we expand this, we've got MD1, which joined the pre-existing MD0. So this, can, this, this visualizer is a really nice tool. Uh, in addition to doing this watch command in the command line, it's sort of similar to that. As we modify the topology, the, the visualizer will sort of show some in-progress visual, visualizations to indicate what's going on. All right, so now we're gonna do the same thing uh, in reverse. So I am going to idempotently apply the original cluster spec and that this is going to now um, uh, this is going to going to determine that there's a delta between the new spec and this this spec right here where there's no longer that md1 in the configuration and i'm actually going to use the visualizer this time we should see that md1 machine set disappear so the way that you can sort of infer this works is that the authoritative set of pools in that um, array is understood to be the definitive configuration. So if we've got, say, there we go, just got rid of MD1. So if we've got like five pools in our array and we send a kubectl apply with a declarative spec with two, then those three that aren't there are gonna be deleted. And I should point out that these are gonna be deleted gracefully. There's gonna be a, a, a cord and a drain as a part of it. So if, depending on your workload scenario in production, if you were doing this in production, that might take a long time for that machine pool to disappear because cord and drain can you know, block on success. But because we're doing this in a demo environment where there's no workloads running on the system, that cord and drain was really fast. Okay, so there is a section here that I'm actually gonna skip because it takes about 10 to 15 minutes and in the interest of time, we don't have to wait for, for this to happen. But um, in your own time, definitely go through. This is a super powerful gesture for cluster API to scale out your control plane nodes. So as you've probably noticed, you wouldn't run a production cluster like we've been doing in this demo with only a single control plane node. So to get that to three or five or some appropriately HA redundant number, you simply update the replica count in the existing I'll show you the 
the, the diff here without actually running through the command. And you can see that if we change that replica's value from one to three, then cluster API will receive that spec and then reconcile that eventual consistency. The way that it does it for control plane nodes is one at a time, which is why it takes a little bit of time. And it's probably best to just skip it for the demo. But super, super important gesture there. Okay, so the final thing we're gonna do here in topology is, uh, well, so I've been, I'll do a really quick demonstration of maybe a more idiomatic gesture for folks used to editing live uh, Kubernetes resources. So this should be familiar to folks if you wanna like edit a deployment um, to increase the replicas or perhaps you wanna change the image from the image reference points to V1 and you wanna update that to V2. So we can do something similar for all these cluster API resources. So as we see here in the, the cluster resource, we've got a replicas count for the control plane. So I can, if I change it to three, then that's, a, that's gonna initiate an eventual reconciliation for that. And if I go down here, you can see that now in, in this cluster spec, I'm, I'm back to having a single worker pool called MD0. If I were to put that to 10, that would scale out to 10 nodes from one. So that's, that's uh, a more sort of real-time view of how you might apply that configuration. And the final thing I'm going to do here is, so I think the, the doc walks through scaling out from one to three. So I'll actually go through that and make that change. So I'm going to, what the documentation is trying to describe is, find the replicas configuration in your MD0 machine deployment, and I'm going to change that to three. So I'm gonna colon WQ, because VI is my configured editor here, and I've got the output from that command that the Docker cluster one resource was edited. Now I can go over to the visualizer. I could also do a kubectl minus W, and as we see right now under here, if you can follow my mouse on the screen, we've got one machine under this machine set. So what we should see in 30 seconds or so is that expand to three. And these, these uh, scale out events will happen concurrently. There, there's cluster API configuration that you can look through in the QuickBook that describes how to set those sort of rolling upgrade type events so you can do N at a time, it's configurable. All right, so now we've gone to orange, so you probably can't see it on the, on the screen in, in that much detail. Just do, well, actually, I can maybe zoom in a little bit. There. So if we go over here, <laughs> well, not there. Maybe that's big enough. You can see this is sort of, it's like Mr. Coffee churning and bubbling. Stuff is happening there. And, and also, are you Docker logged in just to make sure that you don't have the rate limiting issue? In case you have the rate limiting issue, and then just run the prequel script again. Anybody doing any successful topology changes out there? Anyone scaled their cluster? Added a pool, deleted a pool? Cool. Any of those folks do this for the very first time? Never done this before? Exciting. All right, I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip ahead so we can get our next speaker here. The next page in the docs are about machine health checks. So I'll quickly give an overview of what this is. So a machine health check is really a way of declaring certain vectors that um, inform the health of a particular machine. And when that vector goes unhealthy, then Cluster API will, will Cordon and drain and replace that machine. Uh, okay. What step in the tutorial are you? Are you so here is break? an example, hopefully it's big enough, of the sort of, at least for me, these are, these are sort of canonical uh, health vectors to check. So did you, did you at the top, we've got this under machine time health time check, time node startup time timeout. So okay. you're able to declare a sort of maximum timeout value beyond which you're no longer gonna wait for that node and you're actually gonna reinitiate the provisioning process. You're gonna clean up that machine, replace it with a new one. 
So that's one way of configuring a machine health check. And there are these two other conditions that are under the unhealthy conditions array there. And one is defined as type ready status false. So essentially what that means is a machine is deemed to be unhealthy if the ready condition is not met. So when you're doing like a kubectl get nodes, the, the thing you'll see in the status column is not ready. So we've got a timeout defined here. What that tells us is that if, we, if Cluster API observes that a node is in a not ready condition for five minutes, then it's going to go ahead and recycle that node. It's going to consider that an unhealthy event. And similarly, this example here for ready unknown. So if you've got a node in an unknown state, it's going to recycle that machine. So if I go down here further, here's an example of a novel machine health check that we're uh, defining. We're calling it demo node healthy. And similar to the examples above, this, if the status is false for 60 seconds or more, then we're going to consider that node unhealthy. And the reason we're defining this novel condition is so that we can easily reproduce this. So let me make sure that... So the, we ship these machine health checks in that original cluster class spec that's in the example. So I should see those running here. Okay, great. So... Uh, as we see here, we've got our machine health check output. There's not that much detail there. We could, we could get more if we wanted to drill down. But what I'm going to do here is, let's see, just going to look at the machines as the doc suggests. And we've got four machines running, running, running. So I am going to manually patch and make sure to change your Docker. I think, I, I think the way this command works, it's, it's going to manually patch all the nodes. In the, in the doc, I, I believe we scale back down to one before we proceed, but this will be fun anyway. Let's do it, live demo. Uh, so, so this is going to manually patch these nodes with the, the condition that we're looking for in our demo, demo node healthy machine health check. So you can see here in this sort of gnarly escaped uh, JSON data that we're doing that. I wonder if it has to do with the replicas count. The Docker engine there should have those limits. It's not just the Linux machines, but I'm going to set this back down to one. And this should reconcile fairly quickly. Because again, we don't have production workloads running on this, and so the cordon and drain will be quick. And let's see and watch what happens here. Looks like uh, I've only got one machine. Able to create the first workload right, okay, let's retry that command. Uh, the and did I just add a... Uh, fails while it tries to boot. Oops, 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 oops. Okay. So, just make sure I'm doing copy paste. Oh, that was for Windows, I see. Yes. So, I, like, we're trying to wait a little bit. Beware everyone when using Windows escape commands on Mac OS. It's not gonna work. Okay, so you can see it was patched. So we've added that statement, and now if we now we'll see that it's we, we are I was already not quick enough to even detect that machine being recycled. So I'm going to look at the visualizer here, and what are you going to tell me? All right, so we can see now again we're in that. There's a little orange spinny thing that you probably can't detect in any detail up there on the screen, which is indicating that that machine is in the, in the process of reconciling. So we've deleted that machine after patching it with the, the machine health check condition that we defined. And in the visualizer and over here in our watcher, we should, there we go, we see the new machine. So now Cluster API has cordon and drain that prior machine according to the machine health check condition being fulfilled. And then... Uh, according to the rolling update configuration, recycled that machine, brought a new one online, and now we've got a new node. And I think we are ready for Kubernetes upgrade. I know we're kind of cruising right along here. Do you want to give a few minutes? It's... Oh, too many open files. Okay. How many folks are in real time with the uh, presentation on stage? How many folks are way behind? Okay, 
Yeah. We'll wait three so minutes. That's a fix that you can do Just in your remote Linux machine. So. Feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions. And nothing happens. Or I mean, it's just restarted at the point because. Oops. So he was telling us, he was just 
also while people are working on this feel free to continue this lab at home or whenever you find time and if you have any problems feel free to reach out to us on the upstream kubernetes slack the slack handle is called cluster api and we should be able to address any of the problems there if you have any issues we should be able to sit up there and feel free to open up uh, uh, open up a discussion thread and uh, we'll take it to yeah, so let's take a look at what we have right now. So we do, we have one worker cluster that's, that has one control plane node and one worker node, which are both at 124.6 version. Uh, let's try to upgrade this to our 125 version. And so since class API is declarative, we, following the same pattern as we have for the other examples, we just have another YAML file that dictates how uh, that dictates the change in version of the target cluster. And if you take a look at that change, we'll see that the only thing that we changed is a version field in the YAML. So from ch we changed it from 124.6 to a 125.2. And that's it. That's the only thing you'll have to change to be able to bump up to a Kubernetes version. And it's as simple as that, right? Just change one value in the YAML and your Kubernetes cluster upgrade should be triggered. And let's do that right now. So I'm applying the change. Yeah. So my change, up, change is applied. And let's just watch the control planes to see that it's changing. Uh, and you can see that the way Cluster API performs an upgrade on these workload clusters is it first upgrades the control plane nodes, all of them, to the target version. And only after they are successfully upgraded to the target version will it move on to your machine deployments. And if your workload cluster has more than one machine deployments, it will go, it will go and upgrade them in order. And it's completely orchestrated, and you just have to monitor it. You don't have to perform any immediate actions to be able to let this through. And as we can see, the control plane spin up a new machine to be able to pick the new version. And once the new uh, once a control plane machine for the new version is available, it will scale down the uh, it will delete the machine at the older version. And once the control plane is completely upgraded, it will move on to upgrading the machine deployments. It could take a few minutes for this to go through, but uh, let's just let it go through and we'll see that the control plane is completely updated. As you can see, the control plane is now targeting the version 125.2. And as soon as the other machine is scaled down, the 124.6 machine is scaled down, we should be able to get a control plane that's completely at target version. Yeah, it just started deleting the old control plane. How many, are you, how many were able to trigger the upgrade? 
So the control plane is completely upgraded to the target version, and now it's moved on to upgrading the machine deployment. You can see that uh, a 125.2 version machine for the MD0 machine deployment is now being provisioned. And as soon as that is ready, the 124.6 machine for the machine deployment MD0 will be scaled down, will be deleted, and then our control and then our plus is completely considered as upgraded. So yeah, uh, the machine for the machine, uh, the machine deployment is now completely upgraded, and the control plane is now completely upgraded. So we now we just have like one control plane node and one machine deployment node. So the same topology as for same topology as the cluster that we had before. It's just that both of them have been upgraded to the newest version. So let's take a look. Yeah. So we. So we just have one control plane node and one machine deployment node as before, and both of them are at 125.2. Now let's move on to the next section. So before that, we can just clean up this cluster for now. So we don't need this anymore. So let's just delete the cluster that we would, uh, the doc cluster one cluster that we have been using. and. After that, after that successfully deleted, let's move on to the next section, which is class life cycle books. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. We have clusters successfully deleted. There are no more class demo, There are no more workload clusters in our setup right now, so let's move to the class life cycle books. A little bit about cluster life cycle hooks. So cluster API right now has the ability to produce certain events called cluster life cycles uh, events, and they can be hooked into by external systems to perform certain actions. In this demo today, we'll just take a look at a simple extension, simple extension that just receives these events and then logs them. As you can see in the topology that we have here, the management cluster sends certain events to a targeted extent test, test extension server that could be running anywhere. Uh, in this demo, we'll just run that as a deployment within our management cluster itself. And once the extension server receives these events, it can send back a particular response um, depending on the event that it received, and then that can affect the cluster's uh, life cycle in certain ways. A simple example would be um, when a new workload cluster is requested to be created, the management cluster can then send a before cluster create hook to the extension server. The extension server can either send back an allow response or a block response. So if a block response is sent, the workload cluster will be not created, and then the cluster API will just keep requesting the test extension server depending on some of the parameters that it sent back on, okay, am I allowed to create the workload cluster? No, if not, just let me know when I need to check back and so on. So you can set up an environment like uh, like so where you have maybe not one, maybe you have multiple extension servers, each of them dictating if you need to, if you're allowed to go ahead and create the workload cluster or if you need to wait before the workload cluster is created. The before cluster create hook is just one example. We have six lifecycle hooks right now within cluster API and at this demo, we'll, we'll take a look at uh, at least three of them. So as I mentioned before, in this demo, we'll be running a test extension server, test extension server that is within the management cluster because it's easier for us, but ideally you could, you could possibly imagine a case where you're running an external, ser external service or you can run it in any other cluster. You're not required to always run it in management cluster. As long as it's reachable, it should be fine. So for this demo, let's just run a test extension server deployment within our management cluster. So I have that. 
just make sure that our deployment's running, our extension, extension server is running. It's running, it's up. We have the uh, one replica available, so we should be able to move ahead. Once the test extension server is running, we need a way to register that with Cluster API so that Cluster API knows where it is, how to reach it, and additional information like certificates and so on. Um, so here is an example of an extension config, which is used to define, which is used to declare where an extension server is, uh, is and this is how we register an extension server with Cluster API. So for each extension config, you just you need a unique name, and I'm using uh, I'm uh, I have some uh, CA injection mechanism set up right here. So this is just to be able to inject the corresponding CA and the certificates, and uh, the client config refers to where the extension server lives. Since my extension server lives within my uh, within my management cluster, so I just have a reference to that particular. Uh, service that's exposed as part of the deployment, and it should be able to reach uh, the cluster API controller should be able to reach the extension server from within the management cluster. Right? I also have a match expression. This is just to be able to make sure that this extension server doesn't operate on all events from all the workload clusters. So you should be able to filter it down to only act on certain events if you if they match, if they are coming for a particular workload cluster that matches certain labels. Here I just have a namespace label, so only the events that are triggered by workload clusters in this target namespace uh, will be handled by this particular extension server. So let's register that. So let's register our extension server with Cluster API. Cool. Just make sure that it's reachable and it's all good. Yeah, it's discovered. So the extension server is uh, successfully discovered. Cluster API was able to reach the extension server and do the necessary things to be able to register. And there are a few optional sections for you to explore on how an extension server communicates with cluster api to to let class to let it inform what kinds of events it supports and what kinds of events it's expecting um, I'll, I'll i'll leave that for you guys to explore now that we have an extension server registered and an extension uh, server that's already running let's actually look at some of these events uh, so as i mentioned cluster api right now supports six lifecycle hooks uh, we'll take a look at Two of them, so we'll try to create a workflow cluster. We'll see that the extension server receives an event called before cluster create, and then it just logs it. It doesn't block the cluster creation operation. You can always change the extension server to be able to uh, block it, and then maybe rely on some other input to decide when to unblock the creation and then allow, allow the process to go ahead, right? So I just have a file here. I just have a YAML file here that creates a workload cluster. So let me just do that. Cool. Once the workload cluster creation is triggered, uh, the, an event should have been sent to the test extension server. So let's take a look at the test extension server's logs to see that it actually received the event and it logged it. So I did receive the, the extension server received the before cluster create event and I just logged it and you can see that it sent back a success response with retry zero. Retry zero just implies that do not block the creation, just let it go through, let it allow, uh, it's basically equivalent to an allow response. Uh, there, is a, there is a section at the end of this tutorial uh, which in which it's, an, it's completely optional in which you can try to change the extension server's logic so that it blocks, um, and it's completely optional. Try that at, uh, when you have some time. You, uh, for, uh, for this tutorial, we'll just continue with the allow responses, but I would highly, highly encourage you to try it out to get a feel of how extensions, how powerful runtime extensions are and how you can use them. Now, uh, Let's also try to delete the cluster, and we should receive similarly receive a delete cluster hook. And again, this extension server def defaults to just allow allowing the operation to go ahead, and it doesn't block any of the operations. And it should 
allow the workload cluster to get deleted, but as I mentioned, there is an optional, optional section in which you should be able to block it and see that the workload cluster deletion is blocked until the extension server response with a success response, uh, allow response. Uh, so let's delete the workload cluster. Yeah, a delete has been issued. Let's look at our uh, extension server's logs to see that it received the event. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it, it did receive the event, as you can see here in the logs. Uh, Let's just clean up. Let's just clean up the extension server so that we don't change the other, change any other items here. Okay, so uh, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, we have a card for feedback, if someone wants <laughs> feedback here. Um, we would have had one last section, which is about self-hosted clusters. So how to use cluster API to manage cluster API itself. Um, feel free to follow up at home. Um, if you have any problems, any questions, we are in the upstream Kubernetes uh, Slack, um, channel cluster API, feel free to ask um, whenever you need anything. Yeah, that's it. Uh, feel free to stick around, ask some questions, but let's say the official part. So. Thanks, everyone.